with regard to writing, if an essential problem is that people who are quite good at storytelling are already good at it <laughs> prior, prior to beginning uh, you know, educational system like MFAW or something like that, then how would you go about improving improving those people? Because everyone is everyone is naturally so good at it. Like just all human beings are so good at language. It's quite different from like painting or music. You know, almost no one is very good at painting or music, but speaking. I mean, you can have conversations with nearly every any person that you meet, and they can say something shocking and wonderful to you. You know. Which is like if if you could just bump into anyone on the street and they might take out a trumpet and play something like Louis Armstrong, it just doesn't happen, you know. So for the the bar is already really like quite high. That's the thing that is the hardest, and especially in writing. Welcome to Teaching Art, a three part collaged audio essay in which I as somebody who teaches art, try to find out what that exactly means. What should we teach? Who should we be when we teach it? And what kind of space should the art academy be? In this final episode, we'll finally get to that first question. What is it that we teach when we teach art? And can it be taught at all? As I've mentioned before, I've been teaching creative writing for a little over 10 years now. And here's what I know. In the last year of our curriculum, the students work on their graduating work. They get to decide everything about that work themselves. They can choose one of the teachers to guide them. It's essentially sitting next to them, talking about what they made. And I really like that face. I like that the student is in charge, that I am not there to teach, but to think alongside with them. I like that it's about the work and about who they are as artists. The three years before that, I am constantly reimagining, shuffling, completely overhauling. I think that what I'm trying to do is to make it as much as that last year as possible, given the student's age, experience, and confidence. Well, that's the idea. In practice, this has meant mostly removing a lot of theory from my classes and focusing on process, the writing process, but also the learning process, both individually and as a collective. When I started, I thought I had to teach them the big ideas in writing, the accumulated knowledge about the craft since, here he is again, Aristotle. I taught things like three-act structure, which, if you don't know it, is an idea about story structure that predominates mostly Western storytelling. If you're interested, Google will give you a billion and a half search results within 36 seconds. Which is exactly the point, right? Why should I be teaching something that is so readily available for anyone to learn themselves? Yeah, no, I, I, that's, a, that's an interesting point. I'm I'm a, on board with you here. I mean, why why go through these things? That's uh, you know a Google search term away for many of these people. Yet at the same time, there's a lot of bad information, and it's sort of the distilling of information that um, we all struggle with when we go to that route, anyways. True, not all of those billion and a half search results will be good. So one approach would be to present the idea again and maybe make room for some of the ideas that are not so predominant, that the algorithm pushes down to the last 500 results or so. What can we teach in a way that's going to sort of offer them sort of some context? And how can we also sort of bring in some other voices to amplify different story structures uh, across the world so that everyone can kind of think about these, not only from the community they're writing from, but to understand there are many different forms to tell a story. And so something else that's proven to be really helpful in this way is, yes, there's three-act structure. Um, here are some key concepts about it, but here are some ways that you can kind of now start to either flatten that or look at different sort of uh, models with it, uh, different structures, whether it's a spiral structure, uh, uh, you know, forward with uh, dipping into the wells of the past. There's so many ways you can kind of take a three-act structure and start to flatten it or twist it around in ways that sort of has so many of those similar um, pieces in place. And that goes across all models virtually across the world is like, if you have a strong sense of character, does the character kind of move towards something and that. So that's kind of where I think that direction can really help a lot is sort of providing the, the content that, you know, you're right, 
a lot of people can get for another thing. And they will often sort of go off on their own and, and continue to check that. But you're helping them kind of think about it beyond that in a way that's um, a little more meaningful than just some search terms. It's like, how is this kind of um, can be applied as, instead of it just being a rule? And we really try to stay away from rules at all in fiction. This is John Vigna, author and creative writing teacher in Canada. And I think he has a point here. But still, some part of me felt that maybe the students don't need to know about 3x structure unless they really want to. Who was I to know what was important and what wasn't? It basically comes down to the problem of hierarchy in the classroom, which we discussed in the last episode. How creative writing has always been taught to this point from the, you know, the inception of the traditional workshop from the 1940s um, has always been a top-down approach, usually white male approach as well. And it's never sort of um, considered the views of any of the students in there, particularly students of color. And, you know, I think now um, anyone who doesn't do this is now isolating students one after another. And they're isolating all the students. It's not just the students of the community they represent. It's just basically all the students because students are no longer seeing their interests, their voices reflected in the way that the course is being taught or the material that's being taught. So it's it's vital to, at every point within uh, creating a course, to think about how can I continue to sort of decenter my own authority and offer sort of perspectives for students to see themselves reflected in. The most obvious answer to that question is to involve the students somehow in what it is they are being taught. How do we um, decenter our authority in the classroom is one of the things that I hear you saying there. And I think that's something that we're, we're needing to um, really examine more than ever. Um, and you know, there are, there are different ways to do it with depending on the different audiences, but I'll give you an example of a, an experiment I have been working with in my graduate class because it's smaller, it's contained. These are serious writers that are there. And so um, I create a, um, we'll try to create a completely flat kind of hierarchy within the course by doing the following. I contact them before the semester begins, send a, a quick questionnaire to them to find out something about what their doing, um, where, why they're entering this course, where they're, um, what they've been reading lately, what their fears are about uh, writing fiction, whether fiction's their primary genre or secondary one, um, what are um, any readings they would like to see represented in this course this semester. Just, you know, like a, a, an early point of contact before the semester's even begun. So, and I reply to those um, before the semester's begun so that we've already established a one-on-one -on -one rapport. When we come to class for the first time, I've already had some sort of sense of where everyone is at in the room um, from those, those pre-course um, surveys, if you will. And when we come and meet for the first time and they get to see each other, we co-author the syllabus instead of me authoring it entirely. So we talk about like, what are some of the um, topics you would like to learn about in this course this month. Here are some of the things I've seen from your responses here. What are some of the readings you'd like to see represented? Well, everyone re um, offers at least one reading. So we then take those and we put those into the syllabi now, the syllabus. And so without, you know, a very low stakes way, they've already kind of started the co-authoring process without knowing it. And they when they see it happening, because they're part of it that first day, is it gives us a chance to sort of reflect more on like, how are we going to talk about one another's work? What are we going to do here? Um, how are we going to approach close readings? And so it gives another week before I put it into actual, I draft it and then I put it here and they all agree like, yes, this is our course this semester. So now the buy-in is already 100% there because we've all co-authored it instead of it just coming from me. And so now um, part of that sort of co-authoring process is the reading list has been largely determined by them. I bring in my own readings, of course, because there are certain things I know we wish we should look at for voices around um, certain topics. But they also bring in their own. And what I ask um, for each class, for those students who do that, is to um, they will facilitate that discussion of that work 
for about 20 minutes. So what they'll do is they'll come in, they'll know what the theme is of the week because we've co-created that together as a class. It's dialogue this week. Let's look at dialogue in this Raymond Carver piece, for example. And that's what the focus will. They'll offer a little lesson on that, even though they're not an expert, so-called expert on it. They're much smarter than they think at doing these things. And then we all kind of engage with discussion around that. And then I'll take that information and, and sort of extrapolate and, and talk further on it at a, at a, at a, a deeper level than what we've gone. So it, there's this exchange of ideas that is constant in this class that is a sharing of knowledge rather than a dissemination of knowledge from one perspective only. And the, the beautiful thing in doing this is that there's no absenteeism in a course like this because everyone's fully on board and has co-created it. Everyone's excited to come to class because they're talking about things that they are genuinely interested in and is seeing represented in the syllabus. And they are also growing according to the topics that they're learning for, that they, they really wanted to do at the beginning of the course. And so, you know, there's the... I'm finding I've been experimenting with this for about uh, two or three years in this semester of which there's two weeks left. I would say this is the most um, high functioning class I've experienced at this level now in which they're all the depth of discussion and work that is being produced on a week by week basis is um, incredibly high. And although it's not successful in the sense that success is determined by being published yet, it's highly successful in the way that they got there and how it's being developed. So I feel very confident for them beyond the scope of the course that they'll be able to take kind of everything they've learned in co-authoring this experience together. Me not being the so-called only expert in the room, we're all experts in which we share knowledge here. So that's been, that's been one really effective way to approach this. I really like the idea of co-authoring the curriculum with students. And not only in the sense that we have now, where students get to pick from a number of classes to kind of set their own trajectory. I mean, within these classes themselves, like the example John just gave. And of course, this is a lot easier with graduate students than with first year students. But still, I believe it is possible to create some degree of co-authorship on any level. And co-authorship also means that you still have some input as a teacher. And of course, you still have ideas of what making art means, what makes great writing, or even what is a healthy and productive way to sustain a practice. And in talking to these three authors and teachers we've heard from throughout the series, I found that the things I hold on to in their teaching are very fundamental ideas. And some of the most fundamental things about writing and the writing process are hard to put into words to begin with, let alone to teach in a comprehensive manner. So how do you teach the unteachable. There are like two very different tendencies, pedagogically speaking. So yeah, there is like the, the most rational, you know, like formalist tendency or pedagogical orientation, which would be like more from the French structuralism. And then on the opposite side, more or less, would be the Finnish shamanism, um, headed, I would say, led by Risto Ati, who is a Finnish poet, our like personal Jedi master, as we call him. <laughs> and of course, I mean, I, I was job shadowing him for two months in, in Finland. And uh, he's, he has been my personal master over all these years. And he has trained me like as a teacher as well. So um, I would say, like, um, yeah, all coming from this Finnish shamanism has to do with poetics, but also has to do with a certain faith, you know, and, and the relationship of teaching and creation with the unspeakable as well, and with mystery and with things that cannot be, like, easily measurable. But uh, on the other side, that can be like very pragmatic. That's why I always speak myself as a pragmatic mystic. <laughs> In the sense that everything that 
can be, you know, like uh, told about the wound, about the sacred, has like a, you know, like very uh, practical dimension when it comes down to our workshops and when it comes down to our texts and the way to approach them. One of the things in which Lorena Brides, whom you've just heard, experienced the mystical part of writing is actually a byproduct of the teaching itself. She experienced it when she was a student at Escuela de Escritores herself. I, I learned, I think, uh, first of all, like how to deal with crisis. Because like I, I, I always say that for me, like the masters in narrative in Escuela de Escritores was like a Trojan horse. In the sense that I arrived there and I had like a lot of assumptions and beliefs and, you know, certainties about the craft of writing, which were absolutely demolished over that process of learning. So at some point I, I, I got like very frustrated to the extent that I even consider just to drop it, just to quit, because like I, I was not finding myself a way through narrative itself. So, um, well, I, I decided to keep going. And, of course, the, that crisis process uh, took me to a different shore, I would say, where actually poetry and narrative were not, um, you know, opposites, but something that I could, like, eventually, you know, melt into the same pot. So that probably was the most I learned of, uh, of the narrative uh, program, like how do we deal with crisis, how crisis is an inherent part of creativity, that like a real artist must know how to deal with crisis and actually to put himself or herself in crisis into... Uh, in order to have like a real poetics, you know, because like without crisis, without experience of crisis, everything gets like very formulary, you know, like um, just as a um, creative writing manual or something like that. I asked Lorena if, now that she's a teacher, she tries to teach this in her classes. Absolutely. Absolutely, because like only through the process of crisis, uh, asking many questions to the text and to the author is the only way you can get into what to meet, like the, you know, like the magnetic, how, how can I say, like, um, I don't know how do you say that in English. Try it in Spanish. El campo magnético, no? Campo gravitacional. Like, is it, is it like a gravitational force, like gravity? Mm hmm Yes, something like that. I mean, I think that crisis is the only way you can actually enhance that gravitational force that would lead you to the wound. And I'm absolutely interested in two criterias with creative writing teaching and, of course, uh, writing in itself, which is like the idea of the wound and the idea of failure. Oh, you, yeah, you've mentioned the wound before, but, but, but talk some more about that. I'm interested. What does the wound mean? Well, the wound is just like what it hurts when you write, when you create. And to me, that's like actually... You know, it, it has to be with a radical position towards writing in the sense, radical in the sense that it, it goes right into the roots and the roots of all creative process. Well, I would say it's, it's you know, like pain, it's, 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 it's a wound and it's joy at the same time. But uh, I think that without contacting that wound, you are not ever able to speak the truth. I think uh, writing comes from a wound that can be smaller or bigger, even humor, 
is absolutely pierced by certain sense of, you know, like awareness of a human condition in the sense of, you know, in the, in the deepest and dramatic sense, you know? Um, and of course, the degree or the um, wideness, wideness of that wood depends if we go on humor or if we go on, on tragedy or if we go on drama, you know, the gender is quite, it's pretty much conditioned by how, by how big the wound from which we write, uh, yeah, is present there, I would say. So, so the wound, but, but the wound is like a, a metaphor, right? It can mean many different things. Like it doesn't have to be emotional trauma. Absolutely. It can be like a social wound, a collective wound, you know. Um, and of course, um, and there is another fundamental criteria to me. There is like how that wound uh, is the alchemy, like the alchemy of the wound from something that it's very individual, subjective, personal to something that's universal. And that can relate other people. So, so that's what you call the alchemy of the wound. The alchemy of the wound. And to me, creative writing teaching has to, to do a lot with the alchemy of the wound. The alchemy of the wound. It's one of those mystical, barely teachable aspects of writing. It comes out of the work itself. And for Lorena, this is where you teach it. From the work that students do, from reading it. I think that um, when, you know, a student reads a text out loud and when that text brings the room back to silence, we know that there is something that it's very true in that text and something that, um, that because it's very true, it's enrooted into the wound. And because of that, that text is sacred in the sense that it speaks out like a very sacred truth that has been alchemized, that has been through the alchemy of language and aesthetics. And that's why it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, but, but how do you teach that, Lorena? Of course, like you have to put yourself as a teacher in danger in the sense that you have to read through the student as well because and, and you have to become a woundist yourself as a teacher. You know, a woundist. You have to specialize yourself a little bit in, wound, in wounds. And sometimes when I see a text of a student, this student thinks that he's talking about, I don't know, like um, something that is happening in the zombies science fiction's world, you know, in a very, like, uh, mm, displaced reality, nothing to do with, like, you know, feelings and, you know, like, familiar complex complexes or, like, marriage failures. And then, like, to me, it's obvious that this person is talking about, I don't know, the loss of his father. So I think that in that sense, as a teacher, you have the responsibility to point out that into the text. You know, like always relating that wood to the main character or to the character of a story, not to the student, not to the person, not to the author. But you have to somehow find a way to enlighten where's the real wound there. What, what really matters of this story, what, what is really touching the core of a story, and hence, you know, the core of any reader.
So what for Lorena is the alchemy of the wound, for Jesse Ball is finding something you want to say. In the first episode of the series, he talked about the importance of the classroom being a place where you can try out different ways of being. I think that this is the mode in which you will come closer to a fundamental notion, which is things that you might want to say, like really might want to say. And this is what distinguishes really great writing from just excellent writing, is that the great writing, a person said a thing that is just specific to them. No one else was really going to say that, you know? Uh, like, I love, for instance, uh, Robert Walser, because he says all these things that are just, no one is going to bother to say that. Anyone could say it, but no one would bother to say it because <laughs> it's so small and, and like a little bit useless and odd. But then it turns out that, of course, it gives great joy. So trying to write or trying to learn to write with great technical prowess and to, um, in some kind of magnificent, like, you know, postmodern way where you, you can't really even be judged for what you said because it's like recursive and like, you know, self bounding and complicated. Like, um, I think this is much less important than writing in a very plain and simple way things that you want to say and then spending most of your time trying to figure out what's worth saying at all. And to get there, students sometimes have to unlearn something about what they think being an artist means. People sometimes go to MFA because they want to be a writer rather than because they want to write something. And so just that simple orientation that you're going to focus on writing something that is really a gift for other people rather than taking credit for having written something that makes a big difference. Wanting to make a gift for other people. That is one of those fundamental notions about writing we're talking about here. And like Lorena, Jesse also found that these fundamental things, you don't teach them in a direct manner. You don't lecture on them. I think that one of the most essential things is just to love reading and to want to make a gift. Mm -hmm. Those two things are really core. And so when I began teaching, um, I was just troubled by the deformation that I thought might be forced on me by becoming a teacher also, like to be a person of authority when I myself had always hated authority. I thought, why would I, <laughs> why would I want to do this? And if my advice is going to be just read a lot, then <laughs> what's, the, what's the point, you know? So then instead of that, I thought, well, I'll try to create an environment in which we take basic daily things like walking or dreaming or lying and defamiliarize those in such a way that the students at least can be making contact with a different way of being alive and and a way that I think um, makes life into an ongoing experiment then to create is just to share the fruits of that experiment with others I think this can be a very bountiful path. Defamiliarizing daily things. In Notes of My Dunce Cap, Jesse presents several of his syllabi, and only one of them is presented as something similar to a creative writing course. It's writing variations on grim fairy tales. The other classes are about dreaming, about reading Kafka in different places, about derivé and reciting poetry by other authors. None of them are about capital C creative, capital W writing. And still, Jesse wants the students to walk away from the experience of his classes, having learned something about writing. Yeah, definitely. I, I think the main thing would be that, you know, curiosity and time. These are the two things that, that are most important. How you control your time, like not allowing yourself to be, um, to have your time wasted by others. And being able to use your time to, to fulfill your, your curiosity. And then curiosity really flowing out of like the vividness of life that one should seek uh, not like positive experiences that are full of like just full of joy and delight and not negative experiences that are full of like, you know, horror and abasement, but experience like whichever it is that is vividly felt like increase of feeling. And out of increase of feeling and curiosity, and then 
uh, abetted with like level headedness and equanimity, then you can make a life where the continued experiment of being a maker yields like small things that you can share with others as a gift. You want your students to walk away with something. I think that holds true for all teachers. For me, it has always been process. I wanted the students to learn their own and unique process, to develop a mindset in which they don't focus on the result of writing, but on the writing itself, as something they can fall back on at any time. It's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to John Figna. In an online workshop he was giving for other creative writing teachers, he said the following. But really what it is, is the process. We really need to ourselves love the process and to have our students fall in love with it too, right? At the time the workshop was held, I was already working on this series and I got in touch to ask John if he could talk to me about the importance of process. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of like shortcuts for people to get to easier places um, other than doing the work. And I think, you know, for people to learn that there's a process to, um, especially writing fiction, it's a very difficult process. There's a lot, you need to have a process in place that really accepts a growth mindset rather than a fixed one. And that's kind of the area I work at with them now in terms of kind, but, you know, um, rigor as well. How do you go about that? Teaching the process? T teaching them to to find, yeah, teaching them to love the process, I think, the process yeah. of writing. We group at the beginning of every class and we talk about what was your process for working this week through this this challenge that we had. And everyone kind of shares and reflects on that. Not only have they shared it with me in, in written reflections, but now they're talking with one another in our in around the table here this way. And so it allows um, each of them to see there's a wide range of perspectives being offered on different things and tactics they've tried. And no one is encouraged to adopt anyone else's process. But what we're encouraged to do is entertain how any of these other ones might influence or challenge our own kind of notions of doing things. And my, my advice for everyone is like, don't follow one that you think you have to do, follow one that works for you. And so if you take little pieces here and there from different things, great. And if you have your own way of doing things, fantastic. As long as it's like the way that it helps you kind of um, trust yourself to sit down and, and do the work that you need to do. And part of that process that they learn as well as the process of letting uh, letting go of their work and leaving it to rest as well. So that, um, you know, the time between drafts, the time between writing is equally as important as the time it is to to do the writing too. And so this is a difficult point of process that particularly the students that are working on book length manuscripts want to do. They want to get a draft done, they want feedback on it, they want to work on it again. And, um, you know, one of the things we do is we interrupt that process by saying, listen, you've got six weeks here before I get back to you on this, take some time to do everything else in your life and think about everything you've been learning, but do not look at this manuscript in the meantime. Let it let the sleeping genius kind of lie there, lay there a little bit. That's a Chris Offutt saying. And you you get to kind of um, they they learn to trust this, right? And they come back to their work with renewed vigor and interest. So it's really um, teaching process without teaching process is just the discussion of it constantly and it's always front of mind with how we're doing things. What struck me in all of these conversations is that none of us teach the thing that we find most important in a straightforward manner. We're not lecturing on the alchemy of the wounds, on curiosity, time, gifts, process or mindset. Well, when you, when you teach the secret thing about teaching is that you don't get to choose what you teach. The like, you are in a room performing some action that you think will lead to one thing, but meanwhile, you're just being observed. So it's almost as if you're in a scientific experiment, you know, like a an ant in an ant farm, and people are just watching and writing down notes on you. You don't know what you're teaching, other than that you're teaching an iteration of yourself <laughs> propounding something, you know. In a way, the teachers are the Trojan horses that Lorena mentioned. 
But instead of carrying in a bunch of soldiers, we bring ideas and beliefs into the classroom. And these ideas take on their own life, shape, and applications once they are released. In his book, Notes on My Dunce Cap, Jesse Ball writes the following, quote, My own path has always been meandering, and I rarely learn what I am supposed to at the time I am taught it. At such a time, I'm busy learning something else. Only later do I circle back. I began teaching with this suspicion that I was wrong in having the class meet and wrong in declaring expertise. This being true, I felt I must do everything in my power to right the initial wrong, and I must make the class as strange, as fascinating, and as suited to each particular student as I can. If I have 10 students in a class, and they all learn the same thing from a lesson, I am dismayed. What I hope for is this. Some will drowse by the windowsills, doing their own deeds. Some will follow after my words, guessing at what I mean, and learning things that are not what I mean. Some will turn my thoughts over with a spade and find still better thoughts, and some will disparage me. Some will disagree out loud. In this melee, different things will be granted to each one, and I myself will be granted things also. I will leave the class with new belongings. End quote. The series is divided into three parts but the teaching itself can't be separated as easily. What we teach isn't independent from who we are and where we teach it. And when it comes to art, I wonder if we can even talk about teaching, if we really are teachers. Yeah, no, it's a great question, right? I think um, it's we're refining our, I've refined my role as a teacher as being more a coach. And so, you know, coaches hold you to a high standard. They still instruct. They know when to instruct, when to step in and interrupt to instruct. This is constant in, in a coaching sort of um, way. And it's, it's not really a lot different in the classroom from my perspective. It's also seeing them more as human beings instead of um, students of which I have more knowledge than them. If we see ourselves as facilitators more than as teachers, we will come a long way in connecting where we teach with how we teach and what we teach. So it is definitely not an easy thing. Well, uh, this is the difference in teaching in in this um, day and age now for those of us that do this then is it it does require incredible reserves of energy and work to do instead of just um, sitting back as it used to be and and letting everyone kind of grapple with it, right? But as Jesse Bull pointed out to me... You know, they say like with a... There's no point in walking a tightrope that is laid across the ground. This has been Teaching Art, a series about, well, teaching art, or rather, facilitating learning art. Anyway, I want to take the time here again to thank my interviewees. They were Johanna Dijkman, John Vigna, Jesse Ball, and Lorena Brides. I would have not been able to make the series without them, and I know we say that a lot, but not only did they help me think things through, I have learned a whole lot of new stuff talking to them. A lot of which, by the way, ended up on the cutting room floor. There is so much left out of these conversations because they didn't fit the series in a comprehensible way right now. Ideas about how to deal with students' need for validation of their work, about grading, about how to teach rigor, and concrete examples of how to apply ideas we did talk about in the show. And I'm thinking of developing some kind of workshop on these ideas to accompany the series and to take the conversation further. If you are interested in hosting such a workshop or have any input on it, please do get in touch with me. You can do so through the link in the show notes. I also want to thank Studium Generale Artes for making it possible for me to work on this series, and especially Joke Alkema and Katelijne de Munch. Not only were they very patient in waiting on me to finish the series, their input and tips were invaluable in the process. And I also want to mention that the amazing artwork for the series has been made by Corine van der Wal. Teaching Art has been a podcast series by me, Dennis Gaans for Studium Generale Artes. Thank you for listening.